All right, welcome to the Groove Within. Uh, I'm here. here. I'm here with a very special guest, Kevin Scott, from New York City. Yes. By way of Texas, where, where are you from originally? Originally from Alabama. I was in Atlanta for 15 years. Right. And I actually lived in I actually lived in New Orleans for about three years. Yeah. Yeah. And you're here jazz festing right That's now. That's right. Yeah. To those that aren't familiar with what jazz fest is, what would you, how would you describe it? And then... uh, there's different perspectives of what jazz fest is. Yeah. I mean. A lot of musicians, you know, um, it's a great opportunity to see people you don't normally see and play with different combinations of people that you don't normally do. But yeah. it's definitely a grind to be here for a week. Yeah, Some man. Some people do it for two, which I've, I've, uh, I've most been a one week type yeah, of guy. Yeah, one week warrior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you playing late night gigs? You, you played last night? What have you been doing? So I had, I had a pretty full schedule this year. Um, Pretty much from Tuesday till yesterday. Yeah. But then Friday, I had five gigs. Five shows on Friday. Yeah. It's fucking awesome. And then a gig in Laurel, Mississippi with my... Oh, I saw you on Friday. You were playing with that, the, the, turqu the turquoise yeah. thing. The new, yeah. Yeah. You were a monster. You were crushing it. Thank you. Man. It was... I mean, you know, that's, a, that's a, the thing about Jazz Fest, too, and you have to learn a, a hundred songs. Yeah. You know, it's like you have to... It's definitely... That's not your of, normal gig with that group. No, that was my first time. I was there. I think they're in a transition, looking for a bass player. So Ladies they, and gentlemen, if you're listening, bring Kevin Scott into the mix. Like, that, <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, so just to give it context, where, where were you? Was it the Hall? I was, you know, Hall and Wolf. Yeah. Hall and yeah. Wolf. There's, I don't know, a couple hundred people, whatever it was, a packed house, beautiful. Uh, a wave, a wave of groove happening that completely aligned with your two fingers. The entire place was moving to your hand. I mean, that's that, the goal. That was awesome, man. It's it very, very cool. Um, well, that's crazy that you've been doing a lot of gigs because I'm telling you, it felt like you had just got there. You know, at the Helen Wolf gig, that was that was far out, man. So, what, how? So you've been playing a long time? Are you like, you know, you, you so you were in Alabama and then yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I started. You know, uh, let's see, three of my fan, my my father and my uncle and my grandfather and even my mom were all professional semi-professional musicians at mm. one point so, so there's, a up, there's a pedigree so I, I grew up around it yeah you know and yeah. i did but i was real big in the sports when i was a kid yeah what'd and you play i was a basketball baseball player That's I, cool. and then i played a little football yeah we were for, but, forward uh, Huh? What were you a like, forward? Power forward. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I was I was actually like really good until everybody caught up on my height because I was like six foot when I was like twelve. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know. You're the guy. I'm yeah. the guy, but then when I yeah. tried out for like yeah. the, the uh, eighth grade team, I yeah. was like, wow, I'm like, I can't run. I'm not fat. You know. Yeah. I'm no longer gonna be able to do this. But uh, yeah, you are a um, you are a power forward bass player, too. You well, know, I look. I if the sports analogy of the way I've always looked at like how I want to view myself as a, a bass player, as a sideman position. Yeah. It's like, I'm basically like a defensive offensive lineman. Yeah. That's my goal. hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, it's so rare these days in the world where you have artists that are just incessantly on the, the, the trip to try and stand out or, you know, be stand out or just, you know, do something different. you don't find a lot of people that are laying back perhaps as much as, well, Not even what should, but just uh, just laying back for the fun of it. Well, it's all, but I, in a way, it's like the whole point when you're well, if I get hired to play, like okay, like cool, 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 like they, or or whatever situation. It's like when I get called for a gig. The main objective is essentially make try to make everybody sound the best they can, or put them even better than they sound. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, because you want you want the, it's like a comfortability level, and it's like it's. It is in a lot of ways, like you said, kind of behind the scenes, but musically it's up front for yeah. the musicians. Yeah. But, you know, obviously it's a different uh, situation from, like, most music fans. Like, they, they see the energy. What's your earliest memory of Groove? Like, like, like Groove specifically? It's, well, you mentioned Duck Dunn to me earlier, but the <laughs> funny thing is about that is that, uh, you know, my parents listened to a lot of great music when I was growing up. Yeah. And... Uh, but it wasn't until I watched The Sandlot when I was 10 years old. Oh. And there's a scene in that movie where the 
the uh, the wipeout was it when they're when they're doing? Nope, it was the it was the scene where they're meeting up with like the preppy dudes, and uh-huh. it was Green Onions came on. Bum, Booker bum, T. Bum. Yeah, and I remember looking at my mom going like, "What is that sound?" She's like, "Well, that's the bass, the low part." I'm like, "Yeah." She's like, "So would you be interested in getting a bass?" So I got a bass for uh, Christmas that year. Wow, what and, a cool! What and a- then I, my mom got me this uh, Atlantic Soul compilation CD, and uh, I figured out. I think the bass I ever learned was a Tighten Up by Archie Bell. Yeah. And then after I figured it out, I thought that I was done, that <laughs> I've mastered the instrument. And yeah. I went back to sports for a minute. Wow. And then I was 12 was when I got serious about really playing it. When did you start playing professionally? I mean, I started, my dad, I, I, I was playing in like bars with my dad. I was probably around 14, 15. Doing covers and. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean, the first group I ever played in on a, Consistent level was a, a group called Dear Abby. Okay. And it was a drumless quartet of doing wow. everything from John Mellencamp songs to like Credence Superstition. We're doing Credence. Yeah, just a bar. Just a bar. The bar, bar gig. music. Bar gig. Yeah. You know? So yeah. it was interesting that I, you know, I had to like um, kind of develop time kind of fast or try to figure out what that is because I wasn't a drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think kind of contributed to kind of how, like, my right hand, people tell me what my right hand does, which is uh, kind of percussive sometimes. Definitely. Whatever, right? I definitely picked up yeah. on that from, from, you know, jamming with you and, and, and listening to you. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting, man. You've got just such a, such a great approach to the, to the instrument. So that's cool that you started with that mindset of, like, whoa, I want to do what that is yeah. versus something, something else maybe. It just blew my mind. I was like, what? Is, it was like, you know, it's like that, that amazing feeling that I think most musicians try to get back to, they do it for a while, is to have that childlike mentality when you listen to music. Cause yeah. Be less judgmental and just in your own head about stuff. Yeah. So it's like, it just, if, I, if I could go back to that time period of how I listen to music, even half of that would be a way better person. Yeah. You ever listen to those, um, uh, <laughs> A Leave on Helm and the RCO All Stars records. No, I'm not hip to that. Oh, you love that, man. That's a that's a great one. That was like I think Duck Dunn played on that. Leave on Helm. It was kind of like a bit of the Blues Brothers band, like uh-huh. like a Dr. John. It makes sense. Uh, I, yeah, I think Booker T may have been on some of it also. It's a cool. It's like you could tell they just put a microphone up uh, in the barn and like you know they probably just had a three day weekend of just hanging and, and and making music. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So your you know your your situation is you're you're on the road and you're you know you're actively doing your thing. Where where you where's home for you? I'm uh we're uh my wife and I moved back to New York from here yeah. about a year ago. Yeah. So I was we're currently in Brooklyn now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And was that for you as a musician? Was that a difficult or easy decision to make to go to New York? Because sometimes I feel like playing in New York, it's a little more difficult to break in through consistently yeah, yeah. versus a place I like Atlanta. I had an in when I first started going there. Yeah, you had a I, gig. I had, well, it's weird. Like I, uh, in Atlanta, I ran this jam session. It was all improv for like 15 years. Yeah. Every Tuesday. It was this whole community and... Um, about when I was 22, not to go totally off subject, but no, no, I ahead. heard I was kind of frustrated with the direction of where I was going yeah. as a musician. Because yeah. it was like I was studying a lot of harmony and jazz or whatever, you know, the language really. Yeah. That language. And um, I was like, I just, I'm not, I'm not hearing, like, I just could never, like, get, accept, I, I, I accepted from an early age that, like, that language is not something I'm just going to be capable of, like... Speaking. Speaking or, fluently. Yeah. Like, I like bits and pieces of it. Yeah. So I was describing this to a buddy of mine who I was living with at the time. Yeah. And he goes, well, what's your sound you want to do with this guy, Wayne Krantz? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got obsessed with that kind of... Uh, wow. He sh- when he showed me that, all the off pieces of what... The guys that work with him that do stuff. Yeah. So I kind of, like, that was a a mind expanding moment of hearing what he was doing and then me and my buddy Carter Arrington the guitar player we saved up money and got a plane ticket to go to New York to go to the Mecca with the 55 bar and yeah. catch Wayne and Dave Biddy all that scene from like 2000 early 2007 yeah, yeah. or something and um, so fast forward live in Atlanta playing a bunch of gigs I started you know uh, working with Colonel Bruce Hampton which yeah. is like my a major impact in my life like a lot of guys yeah 
And one day, uh, randomly in Florida, when I was backing up this like singer that used to sing for American Idol or some something like that, it was a weird gig. But, yeah. But um, I was at the time commuting, commuting with Tim LaFave just via like Facebook Messenger. Yep. And he got the Tesky Trucks gig, so they were playing like a, a different stage at this festival. So right. at the time, Kebby Williams, who was working with them, I worked with Kebby a, a bunch in Atlanta for all the, the, the free jazz, you know, all the yeah. stuff we are doing, like improv gigs. Yeah. So I finally got to meet Tim, and then uh, Tim and I played a gig together in Atlanta, like double bass thing, and then basically I, Krantz was looking for some new guys to work with, so he recommended me. So I, right. So I was flying back and forth I played 55 bar once or twice a month with Wayne. Oh, so you were just kind of like commuting in. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It was, it was like, me- it, like the 55 bar to this day, even though rest in peace, yeah, yeah. was like Mecca for a lot of guys. It yeah. was like, to me, how the Vanguard was probably like in the 60s or yeah, 70s. Yeah, totally, you know? oh. totally. You know, we do this podcast normally out of the bitter end, which yeah, is another, yeah, another, which is venue, another, another, another venue that has another, that history. You know, but the, in- the interesting thing is like, yeah, like, that we, I was talking about this with Eric McFadden earlier, like the the rate in which people understand these things how important they are it's it's definitely a lot slower in my in my opinion like it's it's harder for people to understand how important people like yourself are or you know just even like the venues that we have left that are still up and running and how you know it's like what you're doing is a different kind of live music it's not the spectacle of like being in you know the the rider in the in the in the in the, the the bus or not even that you know it's just like it's this um but we all have to go the thing is like real eventually we start doing these bus tours and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like where musicians go to like let loose and try things out like and and do showcasing a lot of the times what they really want to do. Because I mean, you know, honestly a lot you know, a lot of guys that get bigger gigs, touring gigs, yeah. that's a source of income more than it you know, is. You're right. And yeah. And that's a, yeah, you know, yeah. it's an honest statement, you know. Yeah. So it's like you yeah. have a place at the bitter end and 55 Bar and other clubs around the country, Maple yeah. Leaf here. Yeah, yeah, uh, Maple Leaf is Labonton, the, the yeah, like these places yeah, that are like, you yeah. know what, whatever happens, let's yeah. do it. That's yeah. a, a release of being where this is more of like, I want to do this right now. Yeah, yeah, you I hear know? that. That's, you know, it's, it's awesome, man. And, and the other thing, too, is, um, you know, there's a, there's a bit of sort of like camaraderie here in New Orleans, you know, as far as like the musicians that are here and the people that are, you know, everyone's kind of like, it's almost like a conference for musicians oh, yeah, in, absolutely. In, a, in a way, you know, yeah. and it's, it's kind of like everyone's working together and playing together. Oh and, man, living, when we first moved here, it was just, I mean, open arms is an understatement. Yeah. You know, and that's the one thing that I love about this city, with the musicians, that there's no egos about people sitting in. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like, whatever, man. You know, it's, it's, it, this guy's cool. Let's, let's play. And it is what it is. It's yeah. interesting. It's like it's like it's like people were so nice when we first moved here. I it's like you're not used to that. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, mind you. I mean, I, I think that there is a myth about New Yorkers not being nice. I think they're the nicest people ever. New Yorkers are like shit, not, dude. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. I mean they, it's they, a different kind it's of different nice. nice. It's, it's a deep nice. Yeah, it's different. It's, it's you know, it's not that like, hey, how are you on the street? Like, yeah. you don't have time to stop right. and be like, hey, how are you? But, but if you stop and talk. It's, Get ready for like your new best friend. Exactly. You know, like that's yeah. that's New York in a nutshell for sure. So it was definitely moving here. It's like the level of just love and appreciation from the scene and people that my wife and I got when we moved was yeah amazing. Yeah. So what's what's next for you? So what you know what's what's after New Orleans? Uh, well, I'm gonna I, right now. It's like you know I've got my original project was called the Wednesday Night Titans. Yeah. And. You know, I concentrate on that more than that's like my thing. Yeah. With Zach Danziger and um, yeah. So I got you know stuff doing with that, and then I started a record label with this. Did you really? This guy named Austin White. Yeah. What's it called? It's called Twenty Ninth Street Editions. Yeah. You know, You're in like uh, like reissues and, and stuff like that. It's mostly you? an improvised based label. What? So it's all experimental improvised music. What? Mm-hmm. That is, what? That's awesome. So we've got. A bunch of, you know, that's that's been taking up a lot of my life. Yeah. We've been playing it for a year now. Wow. Because he has a label called GSI, which is like a very modern jazz label. It's okay. Amazing stuff. So, yeah. But Austin's is an incredible bass player and producer and, and wow. writer. So, 
we've teamed up and we're going Dude, in. Doing experimental bass records. That's cool, man. That's yeah. that's awesome. So what's it? What's a what's an average gig gig for you? Because like you know, you're you're telling me that in New Orleans you're doing the five gigs a day. Like, do you, will you? gig you know a couple times a week or a few times a month or do you go on the road like for long stretches and then time off you know like anybody it's it comes and goes with the the road stuff yeah you know like uh i had a gig last year and uh i i stopped doing that last november yeah so the only road stuff i've been doing lately is with my own stuff with, yeah oh cool Zach. that's fun so yeah you know, so you have to you, know, you have to find other ways to make rent. So and is is this the bass that you use when you when you do those gigs? With uh, Zach, I use the Seric five string. That is a Seric. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, it's just, that's, that's the yeah. cannoli bass. That's yeah, engraved cannoli on it. I love it, dude. Yeah. Like, straight straight from Little Italy. But this Mulan has been kind of like my um, staple, like tour. So tell me about this bass, man. And I see you got flat ones on. What? Yeah. What's the appeal to flat ones? I've never, to be honest, I've never really played. I've never really played flat ones. I mean, here and there I have, but well, but. you know, it's like I, it's like there's a certain mid-range, low, high mid-range of flat wound strings. Yeah, and you know, for you know, because I mean, like my obsessed favorite bass player of all time is Chuck Rainey. Okay. You know, that, Chuck Rainey, you said. Yeah. Tell me about Chuck Rainey. I, I, I don't Chuck know Chuck is Rainey. Just, I mean, you gotta look up his song. Yes. Yeah. He was the top call session dude in New York and L.A. Got He's it. on everything from. All the steel, most of the Steely Dan records that were good, and, yeah, and then even um, Rita Franklin. His list is just Quincy Jones. It's just the guy was guy, a, he was the guy. He was a master. He was the guy. And I've so P bass flats is kind of a, is this is the that's sound, the sound. Yeah. you know. And a lot of times like this is so I'm doing like sideman stuff or like certain genres that are in the funky stratosphere yeah i use this is like my bass because i would think that the the what is it, nickel strings or whatever they're the standard uh strings if you're doing funk would do it but you're right like your your sound if you you know if you see kevin scott live there's a sound you're gonna feel and now that you're saying that i i can i can pick up on what's happening there. there's a certain tension to him too and and i'm with this company called dunlop and i think they make the best yeah flat because they, they make low tension flats yeah yeah because my old i have a 73 p bass I got years ago. Yeah. That is the strings were like 14 years old on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're yeah. these they're Diaderios, but they're they're higher tension. Yeah. So this is a good. It's just a certain bounce to, to the flats. Yeah. And like if you know like with the when I have the tone knob all the way up, I can get some punch. Yeah. If I just roll it off a little bit, you know. Right, you get that kind of old school. Totally, yeah. Motown, that's that's there, yeah, definitely. Like the Jamerson sound. thing, yeah. Du yeah you know? Duck, Duck, I mean, a lot of the times now, people call me to, to do when I, when I do records. They want me to basically do my weird Alabama version of, of Chuck Rainey and Jamerson. So. Of that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would imagine it's great. Do you feel m more most comfortable in a studio or on stage? I mean, it's 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 equal. It's different. You yeah. know, I might. You know, my biggest inspiration. Musically, since I was, I figured out what it was, was just improvising. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, so, yeah. and it's, and uh, composition is a form of improvising, you know, playing freeze a, a level improvising. And yeah. I've always uh, been more drawn to doing gigs that let me have some freedom. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, I just like just the chaos of, and the mystery of like, what's going to happen. Cause, yeah. Because one thing you know going in when you're improvising is it's not going to be good 100% of the time. No. You're lucky if it's good half the time. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like baseball averages. And I love know? it. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. That's my favorite thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, I mean, we were jamming before and that's like, that's the fun of like the risk of it or you know, you don't know what you're getting into. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like a, uh, like a sketchy drug deal. You know, you're, yeah. You're, yeah, you don't no, know. No, it's yeah, a weird, yeah, 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 it's yeah. like, yeah. you know, it's like, is my, this guy going to try and hang out with I'm me? I'm on a dime me? bag in high school. Yeah. Lunch room, yeah. You know what? What band is like crazy? Uh, speaking of Dimebag, because they have the song uh, Nickelbag or something like that. Um, Inside Looking Out, Grand Funk Railroad. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like Dak, I, I forget the guy's name that played in Grand Funk, the I, bass player. I forgot too. But that, and that's part of the that's part of the, the the trouble with it because he is so underratedly good. That lot, that Grand Funk Live, I think it's like '72 or some shit. Like uh, Inside Looking Out. It reminds, it's like Rage Against the Machine almost before Rage, like sure. it's got these like kind of like, you know, it's like really cool rolling and playing and that, that's cool. You were talking about Entwistle before. Was that an influence on you, John Entwistle and The Who? I mean, you know, it's funny that the, there's, 
when you're, I think you have different levels of appreciation for music when, throughout age. Yeah. So when you're, when I was younger, it was, you know, it was all about fast bebop. Whoa, cool, fusion, yeah. Fusion, you know, and I'm, I'm still a huge, I still love metal. I'm still real big in the metal community. Yeah. So like anything fast and like just more, again, I was in the sports, so I was still yeah. in the sports mindset of yeah. like, why is that good? And it's like, well, that guy's blazing fast over everything. Technically, just Technically, sound. Sound, yeah. Right, so, yeah. but, you know, once you, once... It's almost like orchestral, too. It's like, you know, it's, it's yeah. just faster than that. Well, it's, you know, well, the thing is, the faster you play, the more it's... There's only a certain amount of guys who can really, truly improvise at 300 BPM. Because just, just for the sheer technical facility and the muscle memory, yeah. you're going to end up playing something yeah. that's... Happen. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Let's give, let's give it a second. Yeah. Um, we can quiet him down with some music for a second. Yeah. 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 So, how many gigs did you do where you're like doing like pick, you know, you don't know the set list and you're just in there and, and they're calling out? Changes. I used to do them all, I used to do them all the time. I mean, it's like I've, I, the, the pandemic changed a lot of stuff for me. Yeah. A lot of my products that I was touring with just either. Stop touring, or it's they're trying to pick up now. But yeah, a lot. I mean, that was the, that was the thing. It was like a lot of these. You know, I would get called for gigs and be like, "All right, learn this set. We won't have time to rehearse. See it soundtrack. It'd be some crazy music." Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's like I'm used to it. But that was again back. We're talking about the uh, the trial and error. Yeah, it's like I I played with frat bands and like cover bands throughout the southeast. Yeah, like forever just figuring stuff out in the gig you yeah know? you got a go-to groove in a particular scenario so for example someone's like hey it's a shuffle in in a yeah 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 oh yeah yeah show me so like one of the uh one of the uh it's a boogie woogie in d <laughs> one of my favorite like uh, like a, one of my favorite blues lines that i ripped off was from some of that kind of like like freddie king albert king funk era stuff yeah so like if I ever have to do like a funk blues, this is usually the bass line I go to, which yeah. is, uh, let's see if I can, let's see. Oh yeah, there you go. That's one of my favorite. That's fucking fun. Yeah. To, I ripped off the really weeks from somewhere. <laughs> That's he does this thing where it's like maybe like it's all because that thing like the, the blues, the, like the diatonic blues thing, like these. Yeah. I mean, those notes are gonna always gonna work for it. Yeah, so. yeah. Because you know, I, the whole point is like. When you, when you study these bass players, you find the pattern. We well, just you study as many of them as you can, like hardcore. Like I went through so many clone phases of playing. 
Yeah. I would get so obsessed with the guy. Yeah. And then kind of move on. But then eventually, if you do that with like 10 people, you it's your own, it, try, your own language. You're always trying to develop your own thing. Yeah. Which is, you know. What was one of the, what was like a middle phase for you? Like maybe something like, you know. That's a good one, the middle phase. Yeah. I guess the uh, middle phase was like, the bridge was like Paul Jackson, Anthony Jackson. Yeah. With like the fusion jazz stuff. Yeah. But you know, growing up, it was like, obviously Jocko. Yeah. Victor. Um, Did you Claypool. get into like the harmonic stuff on bass too? Oh, like the, like the... oh absolutely. Yeah. 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 Big time. Yeah. And I still use some, some time Do to time. Do you? Will you? Yeah. Will you pull it out? Yeah. Because yeah. I, you know, I use a lot of effects as well. So you hit like the de- like the delay or something like that. Oh yeah, or like some yeah. reverb or some yeah. weird pitch correction thing. It's, yeah, you know, that's very Will Lee. Are... That's very like Will Lee likes to do that kind of stuff too. It's yeah. just like you know this these chords. You know, it's like some really pretty chords, right? Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And was he, was Jocko doing that on a flat, on the flats, or was he playing? I assumed he was always with rounds. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, and like, that's the thing, like, Jocko, as a kid, you hear things differently. Yeah. As a kid, you hear a certain thing, but now as an adult, you realize, like, the guy's groove and tone, and like, he was just, I mean, the, the term genius is an understatement. Yeah. For him. For sure. You know, I mean, he, you know, he, you know because a lot of that stuff will still come out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, that's why I have, like, my fretlesses at home. And yeah. I sometimes will play them if it's my own gig. How many, how many instruments would you say are in the house? I'm down to about 17 now. Wow. 17. Yeah. What was it at its peak? 22. Wow. Did you have them inventory? Did, were they labeled so you knew what was where? I mean, I, I, I keep them all on, like, the stands. Okay, got and it. And I keep, which was when my wife and I moved out of New York in a studio apartment, it was basically a guitar shop. I was going to say, man, like, that's Ooh. a lot of hard cases or just so, even soft cases. Man, well, the soft like, cases and the hard shells went to the storage unit. You know? That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I would just keep one bag or two. Around. Yeah, that's all you need. So that's yeah. a smart idea for those at home trying to yeah. figure out how to outfit your house with, you know. Just keep it all in storage. Keep it all in storage, yeah. That's cool, man. Uh, with this bass you have here, is, I mean, it's such a trip. Uh, you were telling me there's the Master Luthier that's making these. Yeah, so these blue lawns, um, you know, Andy and, and Young June, like, they they kind of took the bass world by storm the past few years. Yeah. Um, you know, Tim LaFabe was the first guy to start playing them, and then I got involved. But this bass is about, I guess, about seven, eight years old now. This is based around, like, a 57. Yeah. Um, it looks beautiful, man. Yeah. And it's it's just like you know, with Mulan's once you, they basically make the year that you want like it was new. Yeah. So it's pretty crazy because you know the vintage market is outrageous now. It's it like, is crazy. It's like cars right now. It's, it's insane, like, yeah. and I don't I don't really agree with how what's that's happening, rolling. Yeah. Because it's like there are plenty. I think majority, and this is probably controversial, but I think majority of vintage peas in particular are not very good. Right. You know, it's right. They it's, weren't they weren't housed by you know, musicians. They were housed by probably like a guy who had it from someone and like Or even the idea of how it was manufactured too. Oh, like, you see are oh, you saying that too? There's yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no, there's gonna be I mean, again, yeah, it was like it was like again, you know, they were kind of improvised. It was like yeah. handmade and uh flying by the seat of their pants making bases. Maybe yeah, maybe yeah. so. Yeah, I mean there's particular years that are more consistent than others, but uh well, that sounds a Nashville at Carter's Guitar. Is like they have these really nice, beautiful old '50s and '60s P's. Yeah. And um, I can always tell when I lift one up by the weight. Yeah. If it's gonna be popping. Yeah. And if the neck, and obviously if the necks, the frets are completely messed up. But uh, but they had a but, but it's funny. I was kind of complaining to my buddy about them, and uh, I walked in the acoustic room. I see this old kind of like refinished P. Yeah. I walked over. It was a '66. Yeah. And it was perfect. Perfect. But it was literally not even, I mean, like $12,000 cheaper or something. Wow. Yeah. So if I. 12000 cheaper. Yeah. I mean, I would have, if I had an extra four grand, I would have bought that. Yeah. That particular 66. It was, yeah. It was a wonderful base. There's something special about picking up an instrument and having an immediate connection to it. Oh, absolutely. Like absolutely. that, it's like if you have that happen, 
and there's a way you can find to make it happen. You know, yep. some, you know I, I always think it's worth going for because there's something totally cosmic about the magnetic, magnetic pull of an instrument that speaks to you. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that was yeah. the, fir that's the first time I, because first time in my entire life I ever, when I got linked with Mulan years ago, it was custom sh order. Yeah. So I was like, I know what's going to happen when they send it. Yeah. I've never done that before where yeah. you just order something blindly. And, just, and get it sent to you. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it worked out. Now I got five of these, all different variations of years and configurations. You, do you care which one you take on the road? Or you're like, okay, I'm taking this one? Or is it kind of like a luck of the draw? I mean, I, I'm, it's so weird. Like, you know, it's, it, it's different phases. Yeah. Like, I'm, like, it's funny. Like, I, I haven't really played my old 73 out in a while because I, Action's really, really high. This is pretty high action, but my other one's like just, just dead as a doornail, but yeah. I've been in love with it again. Yeah. So I brought this Mulan, my old P and the Sarek for... You brought four bases on the road with you. I this. brought three, yeah. Three, yeah. Wow. Because this one has its own distinct thing, too. What does this one sound like? I'd love I mean, to hear, man. You yeah, want to plug me, it in for a second? Here, let's let see. I, this is like a 30-inch bass with a, a low B. The Sarek's, man, they're so beautiful. They're so cool. And the first bass that I got from Jake was a Midwestern. Mm -hmm. It was a four-string, and it was just I fell in love with the concept of what it made me play like because it's a different beast to play this weird thing. And yeah. eventually I, I got this from him. But what I love about this bass in particular, I got flats on it. You got flats on this one, too? Yeah, I had okay. rounds on it for a long time. Yeah. I just go in and out. But How's the flat B? Like, I mean, Present, just there. It's yeah. there. Yeah. So it's cool because this wow. is like a P bass kind of setting, you know. Very P bassy. Yeah, totally. And then put the middle selector. Even though it's got those big kind of like Rickenbacker type. Little yeah, these are uh, humbuckers or something like. Like Zen. I think these are Zen blades or something. Yeah. But this is very, you know. It's very P bassy, girthy. Totally. And then the middle selector. It's more like a jazz bass, you know. You know. It goes there, yeah. Yeah. Jazz, and then this yeah. is like a toll, you know. Oh, so you do the you do the thump thing. You do you do the thump and pop. Ah, uh, not not as yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean I don't have anything there to be against it, but I, I Yeah. You ever learn how to do that triplet thing where it's like the like what is it like uh where they're doing like triplets and shit? It's like uh. You know, like super, like super. You know, I, I, you know, the the way I learned it was the because the video is the double thump. You know this? He, the double thump. What's that? Like the. So basically, so you basically go. Stop. Well, like thump thump. Oh, you go. Like through and then up and then a plug. Dude, okay. So I do this weird thing. Like, like, like. Because I couldn't ever figure out how to, the double thump. That's what it was. Where and, then, it's like, and then Bill Dickens would do, he would do what you're doing, but with all four fingers. With, okay. Which is, I, yeah, I when yeah. I was a kid, when I was studying it, I would, I would always just do two. Yeah. This, but he would go, it would be like. When you start getting to the boom, yeah, 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 yeah. That's kind of like the clay, and that's you how know? Claypool did it also. Cla Claypool's thing, I think, was more because he was like a Stanley Clark disciple. Okay. Whatever you know. Right, right. He do this whole thing. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Like, he you know, would like, do the whole. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah. that's yeah. Which is kind of Stanley Clark. Yeah. You know, yeah, he, that's, Stanley's thing. That's cool. So did you get lost into, did you get into like the Claypool world? Oh when my you were, God, dude. Obsessed. Really? Obsessed. Yeah. Like I got to meet him. Dave Schools introduced me to him. Dave Schools is a great bass yeah. player for yeah, Canada. Yeah, Weisberg. And he introduced me to Les at, this, at the 420 Festival. It was like. Wow. I was just like a kid, you know. And did you pick his, you know, part of the thing about this, and this is why you are a professional musician, and, you know, uh, it's about the hang. Oh, yeah. So it's difficult to jump up and give someone, you know, ah, you're the guy, you know. I mean, I, st dude, I, st I mean, with other bass players, or, yeah. I mean, if I love a musician, that's how I am. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm just going to be like, you're you know? the guy. Do you yeah. know who you are? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like, I don't think it's, if it's genuine, I mean, because, again, like, that's a good topic about kind of like how to, about the networking thing. 
is that, I mean, the hang is everything. It's everything. It is everything. It's, and, you know. In the cur- studio, on the road, on the everything, stage. Everything, yeah. dude. It's, if you, it doesn't, you know, the, the, what's good is not, is, is not, it's like a, what is good, what is bad. Yeah. You know, some people are think this guy's the best, some people think this guy's the best. So yeah. it's like, what's the in-between is like how you deal with people. Yes. Because, you know, when you're, when you're out there on the road for, you know, long as extent ever did was six weeks. You did a six-week run. Yeah. yeah. And dude, it's, a long like, time. it's a long time to be in close quarters. When you're around the same people, how you handle that is, yeah. determines a lot. Yeah. Because yeah, another thing people get is how close-knit this whole community is. It doesn't matter what level. It doesn't matter... Like it, everybody essentially knows you though just through one person or two yeah. people. So it's yeah. like we were saying know. that we're here with with Weintraub's uh, instrument head exhibit right here, and we're all a degree of separation from him. You know, right. or at least I am. You know, and 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 that's been, you know, prior to coming here, I hadn't heard of Kevin Scott, and then after coming here, I spent I don't know, I think I watched you play for three and a half hours or something like that. You know, on Friday, and you became you know my favorite bass player of all time. Wow. You know, w- w- watching you play like. Like to watch people swim and move, and then to hear about you know your story, your of, of how you put the work ethic in, and you know this, this, you feel that all of the things they make sense when they're when they're put together, and part of that is who, the experiences you've had in the van at three in the afternoon driving through Galesburg, Illinois, or driving through whatever town it is, and you know you gotta you gotta it. want you gotta love it more than anything. Yeah, because that's the thing. Because nine hours of the day is taking a leak in a rest stop, grabbing, grabbing Doritos, absolutely, and you know just not going crazy. Did you know, like you know, it goes every. I look at everything going back to the Colonel Bruce Hampton. I yeah. mean, he, you know, when I got with him, because you know Bruce would always have a way of finding younger guys that he somehow knew would would had good intention but didn't know what was happening. How to how to what what anything means? Yeah, and, you know, Bruce. Was, I I could literally talk about Bruce for six hours, probably. We had similar we had you similar know. mentors, I think, in our space. Where where for you is Bruce, and then in New York for me, I was really lucky to have um, Papa Chubby. Who's a oh right yeah right. yeah, and and he was my entry into all of this in this world. Um, you know, I was like a merch boy. We were talking about being like you know my interest being more behind the scenes in music rather than playing, but like. You know, my start was being the merch boy. Then I graduated to like, okay, well, I know how to film and edit video. Let me shoot some videos of him playing, upload it to YouTube, and then I got some views. And then that took me to the label side and to the PR side, and, and it evolved. But those hangs with Chubby were the same thing. You drive through the country, you, you know, you do the circuit, uh, long stretches in the road with, you know, the Lost Boys. You know, you're in the van and you're, you know, hearing about whatever's going on in his life. Right. You know, and it's always something crazy. Always. It's always something new. And, and, and that's the same with any, you know, any, if you're on the road with an art, that's what it is. This is what this is. You're, you know, artists are not normal people. That's why they're artists, yeah. you know. And it's a, um, it's a glamorous thing when you're providing joy. But 99% of the time, at least from my perspective, outside looking in, it seems as if it's, you know, it's just not that way, you know. No. It's, it, yeah, and it's. Uh, I mean, the you. I mean, you know, great. Here's a great Bruce quote on that. You get paid the wait. I mean, it's like. <laughs> it's Show to a venue, it's two true, o'clock. Man. You play yeah. for two hours, and yeah. it's, it's like so. Yeah. But you know, his. I think the the. Again, I could talk about Bruce for, forever, but. Yeah. The quote that I'm gonna get tattooed on me, that yeah. is stuck, that I live by, is take what you do seriously, not yourself. Yeah. Because nobody wants to be around somebody yeah. that is like that. Yeah. That's that's. I think what when people refer to ego a lot. Yeah. It's like they don't, really don't know what that means. What yeah. The term is what, where the definition comes from, but it's really just not having the awareness of like your surroundings is self awareness. You know what I mean? Yeah. Self preservation. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, it's like obviously like there's certain moments where you have to talk about what you're doing. Yeah. Because it's like, hey, we might know some of the same people or, yeah. but. It's just the intention behind it. I think that's Bruce's yeah. whole big thing. It was like, you know, the first time I talked to Bruce about playing with him, yeah. he was basically just like, why are you doing this to yourself? And I was young. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, no, it's like, there's no guaranteed anything. There's no guaranteed money. It ruins relationships. Yeah. Like, you don't have time for anything else. Like, why would you do this to yourself? Yeah. 
And I think I don't remember exactly what I said, but I was like, it's just what I this is what I'm here to do. I don't have any any yeah. other option. He thought it was hilarious. But. Yeah. It's like blind magnetism. You don't know what it is that's drawing you to this thing, but you know that it's a calling that you have to answer. Do you have any other I mean if you're doing it for stardom, yeah, chicks, yeah. guys, yeah. Drugs, whatever, drugs, whatever. Yeah. That all Yeah. It's like going to come it's just in and out yeah. you know it's a lifelong dedication and to, to be it. honest these days it's easier to just do those things on the side and have a 9 to 5 right you know what I mean <laughs> you know what I mean that's a great point you know like it's and so so you know to truly be out there doing what you guys are doing you are a glutton for pus- punishment and yeah. a, and a true believer of yeah. the art and that's what I respect about you so much and, and I'm really grateful that you did this man thank you for, oh, for taking I the time today man. love it appreciate yeah. it yeah. yeah absolutely